people don't realize when you're rolling around the ground fighting with these people, some of them have AIDS, some of them have hepatitis mm. C. Most cops would rather, listen, just put your hands behind your back. Those people are in jail like they didn't make bail. And what you have to do is you have to set up a meeting. It's called a proffer hearing with the district attorney, the bad guy, and his and his attorney. And it's called queen for a day. Queen for a day means he's going to talk to you about what he knows of criminal activity. And he, anything he tells you for that queen for the day, short of a homicide, unless it's a homicide, all bets are off. But anything else, you can't use it against him later. Cars get stolen all the time. Like in New York City in the 90s, we were averaging 150,000 stolen cars a year. I love it. You also worked on that case with Chinese people yeah. who had a Jamaican middleman and they were shipping Audis, like 40 Audis a month in China? The, the cars were going to Shanghai. Oh, uh, so, and they were for who? We surmise government officials. Oh, of course. So what I want to say is... From the moment you encounter the criminal to the moment you put them behind bars, it is often all a huge mind game. So how do police officers cope with their work? Surely nobody calls them when they're happy. As a result, police have to deal with 100 problems a day along with the huge pressure on defunding them. Defund the police, they say. In this video, I talk to Vic Ferrari, one of the coolest cops ever. Vic is a retired New York Police Department detective and an author of several books. We touch on the psychology and police work, and he also shares some of his epic stories. Enjoy the video. At, at like a regular traffic stop, a lot of the times it's people who have their little five minutes of authority that they never had. What would happen if everyone all of a sudden stopped speeding? Would people in the NYPD get laid off? I, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, do you guys have quotas? like a certain amount of people that you have to stop because my country is unfortunately very safe. Nothing happens here. As a consequence of that, uh, the police officers are glorified revenue collectors. They will appear for nothing and people call them for nothing, especially now because we have a deficit <laughs> in our uh, revenue, right? If I was a cop, I always tell myself I would be one of those cool cops, you know, one of those that citizens actually like. But then in reality, a lot of us think that, but then when you actually become one, then you deal with people who lie to your face all the time. And then you deal with all these problems and disrespectful people because nobody calls you when everything is great. So you're dealing with all this bullshit. And even if you, even if you intended to be a good person, then, I mean, you're not a happy camper anymore. It's so not fair that firefighters get a lot more like social credit than cops. Cops, so they, they save way more cats. That's first thing. I'm going to read you something and you tell me if it's true. Police officers are trained to use various communication techniques to gain compliance and cooperation from individuals they interact with. Some of these techniques may include establishing rapport, using persuasive language, employing nonverbal cues such as body language and tone of voice. So it's important for police officers to use these techniques ethically, of course, and within the boundaries of law, uh, in theory, of course. What are these techniques? I know about the trick with reading Miranda warning when you, you, you don't want someone to get the lawyer. So you read it very boringly and like you have a right to, right? You kind of dig it out very quietly and very quickly as if it's something unimportant. A lawyer told me that actually, he said, you know, police officers do that. That would actually work on me as well. Well, it's usually not in someone's best interest to talk to the police, right? Especially right. if they have done something wrong because you can talk yourself into a jail cell. The Miranda warnings is about also custody and control. So if you're in a station house and you were brought in, yeah, you have to be read your Miranda warnings because there's a chance you might not be able to leave, right? You're in there and you're subject of an investigation. But there is also what's called the common law of inquiry, which means I can approach you on the street and strike up a conversation. I don't have you in custody. You can walk away at any time. And that happens. Hey, you got a second? Get the fuck out of here. And it's like, if you don't have anything, you're not happy with it. 
but what are you going to do? You know what I mean? It's like, I got nothing to hold this guy or this woman with. So, right. and you try to pick your spots with that too, because you don't want to make a fool out of yourself and do that in front of a group of people and everybody's laughing at you. So there is a psychology, you're right. And like I said earlier, you don't, you'd rather talk somebody into handcuffs than opposed to getting into a fight with them. This health issue, people don't realize when you're rolling around the ground fighting with these people, some of them have AIDS, some of them have hepatitis mm. C, tuberculosis. You know what I mean? It's you don't want to be run, rolling around swapping body fluids with these people, and, and you know what I mean, getting cut up. So most cops would rather listen. Just put your hands behind your back. I'm going to take you in. You know, you, you'll call a lawyer, and that'll be the end of it. But but sometimes it does go to that level where you know people are on drugs or. They don't want to go back to jail. Someone's been in jail a couple of times. They know the next felony is going to land them in jail, eight, 10, 20 years that, you know, it's, if, if you're, st and that's how cops get hurt a lot of times, because you're standing between them and years of their life, they're going to fight you. Yeah, obviously. Right. And you know, it's funny how often guilty people actually talk. If someone is, let's, okay, let's say someone is innocent, right? And you approached him on the street and you asked him politely, do you know anything about this situation? Do you know where, like, where were you when that happened? They're going to be like, I don't give a fuck. I don't know. And they're going to walk away. Someone is guilty. He's actually going to start talking to you. Like, he wants to be in this conversation. I don't know. He wants to debate it. He's interested in it. When you, when you have someone in the interrogation room and they're innocent, they're going to be like, I don't know. I don't care. Someone who's it guilty. Depends. It does? It depends on, yeah, but it depends on how well they know the system. It, it, it really depends. I've seen, I've seen people, criminals, where you know they've done it, and they just clam up. Listen, I'd love to talk to you, and they're nice about it too, because they don't really want to like poke the bear. They'll go, listen, I'd really like to talk to you, but I don't feel comfortable. Maybe when I get my lawyer involved, oh, because they know they've been in jail before. So I they'll, mean, they'll yeah, pull. that's a professional. That's an experienced criminal. I've also seen criminals that think they're the smartest person in the room. And just like you said, they want to debate you on it. And it's like, yeah, read me my Miranda warnings. I'll talk to you about it all day long. And oftentimes that doesn't work out well for them because they, you know, they don't know what we know. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. and a lot of cops get silly sometimes and they try the bluff. And if you try a bluff and a bad guy sees through it and he knows your bullshit, not going to deal with you. But of course not. How often do you bluff? When do you know when to, uh, pull I don't up? bluff. <laughs> I learned that a long time ago. I um, we had a, a training seminar once with like this detective who was in major case. He had been involved in a lot of big profile cases, and he he explained. I was young. I was in my early twenties, and he explained that as far as you know that bluff. He goes because once you, it's one of those things. It's like letting the genie out of the bottle. You can't put it back in because if you lie to the guy once, oh, you want to yeah. build. You want you want to build a rapport, a trust oh, with yeah. this person. Yeah. I'll tell you, you want to hear, you want to hear a story with that? Fuck yeah. Okay. So we were getting killed with stolen land cruisers. They were getting shipped out of the country. They were going to the Dominican Republic. So I go to this parking lot and I see a land cruiser in the back. I run the plate. It comes back reported stolen a couple of days earlier from lower Manhattan. My partner and I call the evidence collection unit. They come and they sprinkle pixie dust all over the car. They get a couple of fingerprints. Inside the car was a hunting magazine and a dog cage. Didn't think nothing of it. I have the car towed to the pound and I call the owner up. He's a lawyer on Wall Street. And uh, I says, listen, I recovered your truck up in Washington Heights. All you got to do is go to the pound and pick it up. He goes, did you find my dog? And I said, your dog? He goes, yeah. He goes, my wife and I went for a trip in the country. We came back to Manhattan with our dog in the cage. We pulled up in front of my building. We left the doors open. We were taking our stuff out of the car. I left the keys in the ignition. Some guy with a hooded sweatshirt jumped into my car and drove off with my Land Cruiser and my dog. I said, oh, shit. I said, no. I says, I just recovered the truck. He goes, listen. He goes, that's a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. He says, it's a very expensive dog. I love that dog. He goes, please, if you can find the dog. I says, listen, I can't promise you anything. Your car was stolen a week ago. I found it in a parking lot. Let me see what I can do. So by this point in my career, you know, I had like 15 years on the job. I had a lot of friends in different places. And a guy I grew up with, I was actually the best man at his wedding. We went to high school together. He was a sergeant in our latent print section for fingerprints. So when fingerprints are lifted from crime scenes, they go in an order. 
So homicides get submitted first, rapes get submitted second, oh, burglaries get so it takes a while for those fingerprints to be fed into the system to find a match. So I call him up. I go, listen, could you do me a favor? I says, I got this guy with a dog. He goes, yeah, it's slow. He goes, give me the prints. And, and so I sent the prints down. He feeds them into the machine. A couple of days later, he calls me back. He goes, believe it. He goes, I got a hit. I said, no shit. What do you got? He goes, he goes, he's like a homeless crackhead guy. Like he was looking at his rap sheet. I go, send me all the paperwork, right? So this guy is, he, we call him a road pirate. A road pirate is like a greasy crackhead that'll break into your car for your CDs and DVDs. Like not a professional car thief. He's an opportunist. If oh, you yeah, leave your door open, he's going to walk into your house and steal something. If you leave a lawnmower in your front yard, he's going to walk off on it. He's a drug addict fe feeding his drug habit with stealing shit, right? And the guy was homeless. He had been arrested in like four out of the five boroughs. So it's going to be a pain in the ass finding this guy because he's got he's homeless, right? So what I did was, oh, and the one thing, so in his criminal record with all these bullshit arrests, like he had hundreds of just bullshit arrests. There was a bank robbery where he did like seven years in a federal penitent. This doesn't match like a bank robbery and then stealing change out of someone's car. So anyway, what I did was I filled out what's called a wanted card. A wanted card is not a warrant, but a warrant card will get attached to your NICID number. And what happens is when you get arrested, well, nowadays it would be an email. Back then it was a fax. When the person gets arrested, the detective that put in a wanted card will get a notification. Hey, your guy just got arrested here. You got 24 hours to pick him up or he's going to get freed, right? So I'm going home. A fax comes out and I go, oh, shit, he got locked up in Manhattan last night. Perfect. The next day, my partner and I get up first thing in the morning. We run down to the courthouse and his case got dismissed. He's walking out of the courthouse and we grab him. And we arrest him. And he's like, what's the charge? He was a filthy little street urchin. And he's like, what's the charge? And I'm like, don't worry. I'll explain everything. So we bring him into the precinct. And on, on a desk, I've got photos of the Land Cruiser. I took a bunch of photos of the Land Cruiser, right? I read him his Miranda warnings, right? He goes, yeah, I'll talk to you. Because he doesn't know what we arrested him for, right? So he sees the Land Rover, uh, Land Cruiser, and he's looking at it. I go, did you steal that car? No. Have you ever been in that car? No. Have you ever touched that car? No. You never moved it, worked in a parking lot. No, no, no. I'm locking him in because now he's telling me he's never been near that car. How can his fingerprints be inside? Sure. That's a lie. Yeah, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So finally, I says, listen, I show him the card. I go, your fingerprints were found in the card. I go, you're going away. He says, with your record, you're going to do about three years, right? And he goes, oh, shit, blah, 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 blah. I says, I'll tell you what. I says, there was a dog in that car. And I could tell just by the way he sat back in the chair, he knows what I'm talking about, right? I go, here's the deal. I says, I can't cut you loose, but this is what I'll do. I go, you tell me who you sold that dog to. I says, I'll work with the district attorney and I'll try to make sure you don't go upstate. Maybe you can get 90 days on Rikers Island in the city jail or do under a year. I says, but if you fuck me and jerk me around, I says, the district attorney is going to throw you in jail for three years. I go, so if you want to play ball, he goes, yeah, come on. So we put him in the car, we handcuff him, we put him in the car. He brings us up to the neighborhood where we recovered the car. And we pull on this block and he goes, it's on this street. I think that building over there, he goes, I sold it to a woman for like 20 bucks. I said, okay. 20 so, bucks. Wait, it gets better. I go, why didn't you sell the car? Well, he was a crackhead. No one took him seriously that he had this $60,000 land cruiser in a parking lot, uh, a land ro uh, cruiser in a parking lot. So he couldn't sell the car. And he sold, sells the dog for 20 bucks. He goes, how much did the dog, how much is that dog worth? I go about, I don't know, about three grand. He goes, three grand? I could have gotten fucking three grand for the car. Like he get, he's getting like upset. And I go, what happened with that bank robbery? He goes, oh man. He goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, I come up with this idea to rob a bank. And when he's coming out of the bank, the dye pack explodes in his face. So right. he got like three, he got like three blocks from the bank and the money blew up all over the place and he was covered in red ink and the cops grabbed him so we wound up getting seven years for the bank robbery so he was like a loser like anything he, he was like Midas in reverse everything he touched turned to shit so we're stand, we're parked on this block and here comes this woman I'll never forget she was overweight with bright pink spandex and she comes bouncing out of the building with a dog and I go is that the dog he goes yeah so we approach her and you know senor senora you know my partner spoke Spanish and we're talking to her and she does not want to give up the dog. I'm like, lady, look, it's not your dog. 
he I go, he sold it to you, right? She goes, yeah, I go, he stole it. So long story short, we got the dog back. Um, the guy was so happy, um, the, the attorney. And I, I kept my word. I told the district attorney, I says, listen, before you throw the book at this guy, he is a scumbag, but he helped us getting this dog back. So I think he got a year, but he did it in the city, like on Rikers Island, New York City, as opposed to being shipped 200 miles, 300 miles in upstate New York. So he was happy. So everybody was happy. The guy got his dog back and he did a little under a year in jail. So how legit are these offers by the police officers? If you're in their interrogation room and they tell you, look, if you kind of snitch on these people or if you tell me that, I'm going to gonna make your time a little bit easier. Is that because if I were a criminal in his case, I would want like a written contract where it's written down and we both sign it. Is that like there wasn't a time? Well, there wasn't time for a written contract because it's a dog. It's a living thing. It's not a kidnapping where, you know, someone, someone could die, but it, it's an animal. And district attorneys are very happy when someone takes a plea bargain. Because the longer something draws out in court, the more money it costs, the more resources to run something past the grand jury, then to court appearances, then to select a jury. Nobody wants, uh, with the exception of the defendant, nobody wants something going to trial. It just takes too much time and money. So if this guy would take a plea to a felony or a misdemeanor and be shipped off to Rikers Island, as opposed to dragging his feet, it going nine, 10 months a year, and then it goes to trial. That was something I knew the district attorney was going to say, yeah, all right, he'll take a plea, it, it, you know, no problem. Now, on the other side of the coin, when you lock somebody up for something serious, okay, and someone's got a worse record than him, what usually happens with that is those people are in jail like they didn't make bail. And what you have to do is you have to set up a meeting. It's called a profit hearing with the district attorney, the bad guy, and his and his attorney. And it's called queen for a day. Queen for a day means he's going to talk to you about what he knows of criminal activity. And he, anything he tells you for that queen for the day, short of a homicide, unless it's a homicide, all bets are off. But anything else, you can't use it against him later. So, so what you're doing the, is so what's the purpose of a queen day? If he can give you information and you believe that his information is valuable and and, and trustworthy, you what you'll do is you'll get him out of jail and you'll sign him up as a confidential informant, and then you'll use him to bring in search warrants or arrests. Are you obligated to do that? Like, how does he know that you are going to do it? The district attorney works out a deal with him. Oh. Oh, you, you want to hear funny stories with informants? Yes. We I get a phone call from major case narcotics. And I'm a detective in the auto crime division. And they say, listen, we've got an informant. He's really good. He knows about an employee in Department of Motor Vehicles that's pumping out fake driver's licenses. Would you guys be interested? I said, yeah, we'd, lo we'd love to meet him. So we set up a meeting um, up in Washington Heights. It's pouring rain. Guy comes out of a diner with a hooded sweatshirt. He jumps into the back of this car. So you got the two major case detectives sitting in the front seat of the car, me and my sergeant in the back seat, and this informant gets in. So, you know, hi, we introduce ourselves, like, what do you got? And he explains to us what's going on in this Department of Motor Vehicles. We go, oh, great. Because everything he said, we knew to be true, right? So I said, you know, would you would you be able to take one of our undercovers, walk him into the Department of Motor Vehicles, point him out to the clerk, and have that clerk give him a, a phony driver's license? He goes, yeah. He goes, he does it all the time. I go, perfect, right? So it's pouring rain. We're in this really bad neighborhood, right? So the two detectives up front tell the guy, do you want us to drop you someplace else? He goes, no, 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 I'm fine. It's raining out. He throws on his hooded sweatshirt. He gets out of the car. So we're sitting in the car in the rain. We're underneath the elevated section of the train, right? And we're just sitting there. We're talking. They go, what do you think? I says, I think it's great. Do you mind if we use him? No, no, no. Bro. You got his number. Call him up like, great. While we're sitting there, a guy walks past us in the rain, hooded sweatshirt, and he looked like a delivery guy. He's carrying what looked like Chinese food, like in a um, a plastic bag. Guy right. just happens to walk past us, right? 30 seconds later, the detective in the front seat, his phone begins to ring. So he picks up the phone, and it's the informant who just got out of our car. And he's telling him, he goes, yeah, yeah, really? Okay, thanks. 
gets off the phone. He goes, that was the informant. I go, yeah. He goes, you know that guy that just walked by? I said, yeah. He goes, he's a courier. That guy, he he's a friend of the informant. That guy drops off drugs in the Pathmark parking lot. He goes, we're going to do a rip. Do you guys, would you mind guys hanging around? I said, no, right? So we follow this guy. This guy's walking in the rain with a shopping bag, right? Goes into this very crowded Pathmark parking lot, walks to the back of a Honda Accord, opens the back seat of the Honda Accord, and gets in. He's in the car 30 seconds, gets out without the shopping bag. Like, holy shit, it's a drop, right? <laughs> so that guy walks off the set, guy walks away, right? The Honda Accord starts backing out. So the detectives from Major Case go, do you mind if we grab this guy? We're like, no, yeah, we'll help out, right? So you got to be careful. You don't want to get into a chase in the rain. You don't want to kill anybody in a Pathmark parking lot, right? So we cut the car off in the rain. We pull open the doors, and it was a man and a woman from New Jersey. I think they were from Trenton, New Jersey, which is about 90 or 100 miles south, right? We pull open the doors, and in the back seat is a half a kilo. It was a kilo or a half a kilo. I forget. Ah. And Oh, yeah. And that, that was just, you know, when they locked them up. And the funny thing is, like, the informant just so happened to see the guy walk by and call them up and goes, that guy, he delivers drugs every day. And it was, you know, th those guys called an apartment and said, bring it down. And we just happened to pick them off. But shit like that used to go on all the time. I love it. You also worked on that case with Chinese people yeah. who had a Jamaican middleman and they were shipping audis, like 40 audis a month in China. The, the cars were going to Shanghai. Oh, uh, so, and they were for who? We surmise government officials. Oh, of course. <laughs> and so the order was the, they had to be Audis and the cars had to be silver and black. So we were getting killed. We were losing Audis every day in New York. And cars get stolen all the time. Like in New York City in the 90s, we were averaging 150,000 stolen cars a year. It's a lot of oh, stolen wow. cars. But they usually turn up. The parts turn up, a shell turns up, they turn up burned, right? These Audis were just vanishing off the face of the earth and they weren't turning up anywhere. So we knew we had a problem. And this guy gets arrested in the Palisades Mall up in uh, another county and he starts spilling his guts about this thing. What you have is these Chinese guys based in Brooklyn. One of them was an ex-military or current, I don't know, intelligence officer. He rents out a warehouse in Brooklyn. He hooks up with this Jamaican man, uh, Jamaican middleman from the Bronx. And the Jamaican guy knows all these car thieves. So the Chinese guy pays the Jamaican $5,000 a car. The Jamaican pays the car thieves between $500 and $1,000 a car. They steal the cars. They park them on the street. They let them cool off, make sure they don't have low jack or GPS. Then they take them two or three at a time. First thing in the morning, seven, eight o'clock in the morning in this warehouse in Brooklyn, they open the gate. Two, three Audis go in. They close the gate. Inside this large warehouse, they had shipping containers. So what they would do is they would drive two stolen Audis per container, let the air out of the tires so the car would sit low in the container. Then they would build a wood frame above it so they could hoist another one or two Audis in a car. So each shipping container contained between three and four stolen vehicles. Oh. Then they had a trucking company take the shipping container out to New Jersey across the Hudson River. They were put on trains, railed across the United States to Long Beach, California, and then they were put on cargo ships and shipped to the Pacific Rim. So we had wiretaps. We had Chinese detectives monitoring the Asian wiretaps. We had Spanish detectives monitoring the thieves wiretaps. And what we quickly figured out was our thieves who were making a lot of money stealing cars were in the murder for hire business. You probably had about 10 thieves involved in this and probably out of the 10, six or seven had bodies on them. At one, at one point during the case, I mean, and these guys were into everything. At one point during the case, these guys went down to Virginia. I mean, we knew about it because we were on wiretaps. They go down to Virginia, which is, you know, four or five hours from New York City, and they do a commercial burglary at a Harley Davidson uh, dealership, and they steal motorcycles and crates. They steal jackets. They steal helmets, and they bring it back to the Bronx, and they put it in a, they put it in a garage in back of one of the guy's houses, and these guys are selling this stuff piecemeal out of their garage. Well, a couple of the neighborhood kids figure out this stolen shit in the back of the garage. It's stolen. They go, they break into this guy's garage <clears throat> and steal the guy's shit. Well, he turns around and kills the guy. 
Oh, so yeah, right, like right in the middle of the case. So we had to pluck those two guys off the playing fields in the middle of the case. But fortunately, it didn't jeopardize the other case. But when we took that case down, one of the main um, guys involved in it, the 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 big time thief, he was the getaway driver on a lot of these homicides. He did not want to go to jail for the rest of his life. So he started spilling his guts the minutes we put handcuffs on him, like he was willing to play ball. And uh, we were able to solve probably between 13 and 15 homicides. How do you track people? Do you often check their social media, like Facebook, Instagram? How how common is that among the police department? Now they do it all the time, but you got to remember oh, that that case was done. I mean, that we took that case down in like 2000 or 2001. So, I mean, there really wasn't social media. You, sure. know, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. It was uh, AOL chat rooms, I think. <laughs> you know what I oh, mean? Yeah, like, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's before your time. But- no, it was more difficult. Um, we were on wiretaps, um, surveillance, a lot of filming. Um, you know, like if they were going to do something, we would try to get there first and film it. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times we knew they were going to steal something. Or what, what, what actually blew that case up was they got greedy. Because we were going to listen to that wiretap for a long time. We were going to get a lot of stuff out of it. And what, what ultimately ended that case was they got greedy. The main thief used to be a, uh, a garage attendant in an Upper East Side of Manhattan parking lot. So you park your car, you give him the keys. So his friend still worked there. So he tells his friend, listen, I got an idea. I'm going to come up there with tomorrow night with 10 guys. We're going to come late. I'm going to give you $3,000. You give us the keys to all the luxury vehicles. I'll tie you up and put you in the trunk of the car. Give it about 10, 15 minutes till we're gone. Stop making a lot of noise. Bang on the trunk. When the police come, just tell them it was a bunch of guys in ski masks and you can't identify anybody. We're listening to this. So the guy goes, yeah, sure. So what winds up happening is they we're filming. We got a camera outside. The 10 guys go into the garage. They're in there about 20 minutes. 10 luxury vehicles come flying out of this lot. We got cameras in Brooklyn. We watch the cars go into the warehouse in Brooklyn. The gates go down. The 911 call comes in. The guy calls the cops. The precinct cops come. They let him out of the trunk. The guy tells the bullshit story. So we think it's funny, right? That night on the phone, the main thief is talking to his uncle or his brother-in-law, I forget. And he says, did you sweep those cars for LoJack and GPS? Did you make sure none of them had tracking devices? And the guy goes, yeah. And he says, don't, yeah, did you? And the guy goes, yeah, don't worry about it. He goes, well, I am worried about it. He goes, don't worry about it. They didn't. And inside the garage, when someone reported that car stolen that night of the following morning, the beacon of a LoJack is now pinging inside our garage where this international shipping case is. So when the NYPD, it, if you're working in a sensitive unit like organized crime, we don't tell the uniform cops what we're doing because then they would sit in front of the place and stare. <laughs> They figure out there's a low jack hit being in this garage. So what they wind up doing is running into this garage. They see a bunch of Chinese guys in there. If memory serves me correctly, they had a false wall so you couldn't see the cars. So they were confused. They couldn't figure out what was going on. The Chinese guys ran out the back door, right? And now the phones are blowing up. They, they found the warehouse, you know, and that now we had to scramble and round everybody up in 24 hours. And it's funny, my partner and I caught two of the factory workers and we didn't have the factory workers ID'd. We only had their photos and we knew they lived on this street, but we didn't know nothing else. We didn't know what apartment, what building. We just had surveillance photos. And my partner and I are driving down the street and I see two Chinese guys coming out of the out of an alleyway with suitcases. And my partner goes, how about them? So I slam on the brakes. We walk up to these two guys and they're pretending that they don't speak English. And I see in the guy's top pocket, a plane ticket to Toronto. Holy and I stuck my hand in his shirt and I felt his heart. And it was going, I said, yeah, I, I think we found who we're looking for. So I got on the radio and we called some of our coworkers that were Chinese that had been following them. They show up and they go, that's them. You got them. And we said, all right, perfect. But you see, that's the funeral of a lot of professional criminals. They start making stupid mistakes when they get too comfortable. I have a neighbor, actually. She shoplifts all the time. I'm not sure how smart it is to say that, but she shoplifts everything. She shoplifts 
beef steaks from a grocery store and now she's selling it to her grandma and you know and but recently she got caught right what she tried to do was she tried to literally take a whole bunch of shit and literally like have it in her hands and try to walk through the cash register she tried to do that and she always and she loves to tell me these stories you know i i, I can't really say them right now but she said look right. I just walk in like I own the place, like I work here. And I'm like, mm -hmm. at the beginning, you were really trying to hide shit. Like you were putting effort into making this work. But now you're like, now right. you don't even care anymore. So it sounds it's like, like she's bored. It, it does sound like she's bored. Yeah. And they, they feel like they can become invincible. I mean, having a play ticket to Toronto right in your pocket where everyone else can see it. That's a stupid mistake. The more professional you are, the more rookie mistakes you start to make. Well, Look at it this way. So I think I think um, the cops running into the warehouse was like 2, 3 in the afternoon. They ran home, probably made a couple of phone calls, booked the flight, right? Printed out the tickets. Or maybe they had an open air ticket. I don't remember. But they were they were leaving. Like, we grabbed them 5, 6 o'clock at night. So they, they were leaving the country within hours. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. They, okay. they definitely well, had yeah. like a blow okay. drill set up. Mm -hmm. Um, and they probably figured, they probably figured, you know, it, it was just precinct cops. It wasn't a long-term investigation. We didn't know where they lived. You know what I mean? It, it's criminals often don't know what the cops know. You know what I mean? They don't know who's ratted. They don't know if there's a camera. They don't know if someone's listening to their phone. And that but, yeah, doesn't that help was... either because you become paranoid. Someone looks at you for one second more and you're like, fuck, he knows something. Look, a professional criminal's life deals with paranoia. Oh, yeah, right? of course. Yeah, they can manage it. Well, if you're doing something wrong, you, you have to look over your shoulder. I right. mean, it's just, yeah. you know, unless you're going to walk through the cashier line with a thing full of beefsteaks. And it kind of becomes an everyday thing, you know. You don't even look over your shoulder anymore. You just take it for granted because what are you going to do? Are you going to be afraid every day? See that, like, that's why yeah, I. That's true too. Yeah, yeah, you know, and okay. So, uh, what advice would you give to someone when they're dealing with the police and they are innocent? Well, like, we're not giving advice to criminals here, but let's say they're innocent and they're being stopped at a, like a, maybe for a speeding ticket or maybe something bigger happened and they're in, you know, they're in danger of actually having some serious repercussions. How do you how do you deal with the police? Like, what are some rules? Spill well, the beans a little bit. The, the, yeah, sure. The, the less time you spend with a cop, the better it's going to be for you, right? So when you get pulled over, so first of all, I don't know how it is in your country, but in the United States, you have to have a, a vehicle registration and an insurance card. So always have that in your bag or someplace in your car that you just, you're not digging through your bag looking for, oh, it's up here. It's up here. You, you want to hear you 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 just want a hand, and that that that'll probably get you out of a drunk driving arrest. Because the longer you're spending with the cop, the longer he could smell you. The longer, so when you get pulled over for anything, pull right over, roll down all the windows, turn the car off, and stick your hands out the window. The cop's going to approach. He's going to say, "Let me see your license and registration." Yes, sir. Boom. Once he's got your documents right. You, you've done everything right. You shut the car off. You got the windows down. You can see that you're not a threat. You got your hands out the window. Can I can I reach in and get this? Always ask permission, right? Before he turns, after you give him the docket, before he turns, say, if you know what you did wrong, you blew a red light, you, you, you know you got a headlight out, that's when you start with your story. So it's, officer, I I, I know I'm speeding. I know why you pull me over. I got to pick my kid up for school. She's, you know, the daycare isn't going to hold her forever. And I, you know, I just had a fight with my boyfriend. I apologize. Hit them with that after you've done everything right and given them the documents, right? Don't give them the song and dance while you're digging for documents and everything. You're just going to confuse them and frustrate them. And hopefully, if you can make yourself a person and not a ticket, he will say, all right, you know what? He or she, she's all right. They, they, they did everything right. Even if you get the ticket, don't be nasty with him because he's going to make a notation in his book or it's going to stick with him that if you do go to fight the ticket, he's going to say, oh, I remember her. And they're going to bring their A game. 
that's the you sentence know, it, you don't want to hear that's the sentence you don't want to hear oh i remember him right and you know maybe if you were nice and you go to traffic court that day he might not be as prepared he might have amnesia so even when he gives you the ticket just either say nothing or be nice and nobody wants a ticket i know i'd be pissed i mean after i retired from the police department i've lost my superpowers i got to drive the speed limit and wear my seatbelt. But, you know, it's it's the same thing. If I were to get a ticket, I wouldn't be happy about it, but I wouldn't get mouthy with the cop because if I fight it, he's going to remember me. Also, he's going to be anxious from there on because let's say you have someone and their hands are all over and you don't know what they're carrying and now they're doing this and they're doing it and they're like, what the fuck, dude? Like, I don't know who you are. How, how, how does it feel? Like, do you ever get used to that feeling of walking up to a car and you don't know who the fuck is in there and what, what the deal is and what they're carrying? I did it all the time. I mean, especially in auto crime, I pulled over thousands of cars. Did you um, become kind of like immune to the, the fact that there could be some danger in that car, like for you? I wouldn't call it immune, but you, you definitely knew there was a possibility of you could get shot. You could get dragged. I've been dragged in stolen cars. Um, I've fought with people with a gun in their waist, getting somebody out of a car. Um, you've got you've to watch their – you just have to look for social cues. You have to – it's psychology and it's also you've got to you've got to watch people's body language you know what mm -hmm. i mean like one of the oldest tricks of the books and, and um gypsies do this a lot like you'll pull them over they jump out of the car and they're handing you shit oh uh, yeah here's my paperwork here's the bill of sales whoa 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 get your ass back in the car you can hand me this get in the car you can hand me this stuff from inside the car. I because when someone gets out of a car and they're approaching you, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about an innocent person that just got really nervous. I'm talking about a criminal. There's something or someone in that car they don't want the cops to see. Yeah. So they kind of try to head you off and distract the shit out of you. The hey, I'm all right. It's uh here's all this paperwork, and oh no problem. One time we were getting killed with burglaries in my this is freaking years ago we we're getting killed with burglaries and um it was these guys they were going to apartment buildings in the daytime and they would knock on old people's doors and they would say the superintendent of the building sent us up here you have a roach infestation don't worry about it the building's paying for it and these old people would let them in two or three of them would walk into the apartment with a can of spray and one guy is distracting the woman and spraying for roaches the other guys are ransacking getting her jewelry out of, out of her jewelry box right so we knew we had a robbery pattern and then it stopped. It went away for a while. Mm. And one day we get a call of a suspicious vehicle in front of a building. I pull up. There's a car with three males in it out of state plates. They look at us. We get the hairy eyeball and they drive off. I pull them over. Guy gets out of the car and starts handing me shit. I go, get your ass back in the car. He gets back in the car and I go, what are you guys doing? And he goes, oh, we're exterminators. Now, the funny thing is, as a, as a teenager, before I was a cop, I worked for an exterminating company. Bad luck for him. So I said, you need three guys to exterminate shit? And he goes, well, you know, but he's just talking out of his ass. And uh, I go, what kind of poison are you using? And he didn't, he didn't have a name or anything. So I go, all right. So we locked him up and we bring him into the precinct and we started doing lineups. And all the victims, it's him, it's him, it's him, it's him. So they were Romanian gypsies. They were traveling the United States. And the funny thing is they had arrests all over the place, like all over the country. But they were hitting, you know, they travel. They sure. go to different cities and they hit and then they go somewhere else until it cools down. And then they do their act somewhere else. But, yeah, I'm always leery when people start handing me shit. But you were dragged into a car. How did that happen? Like they just pull you from the window? No, and no, drag no. Um, oh, God. Mid nineties, I run a plate, comes back stolen. We're fo we're in an unmarked car that looks like a cab. We're following this car. It's snowing out, a lot of snow, right in New York. And um, when you're following a stolen car, you don't want to get into a chase. What you want to do is get them blocked in traffic where there's no way to go, yeah, and then you just jump out and pull open the doors and yoke them, pull them out of the car, right? Yeah. So we 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 go down this narrow street. There's a car stopped at a light in front of them. They got nowhere to go. So we pull up on their bumper. My partner and I jump out. We pull open the doors. Don't fucking move, right? So they look at us. 
I put my gun in my holster and I go to pull the passenger out. The car in front of them makes a turn. Now they've got an open lane. The driver slams on the gas. So I'm pulling. I'm holding on. I'm trying to yank the passenger out of the car. And there's so much snow. I'm getting dragged. So my partner's yelling at me, let go, because I'm going down the street. I'm going like surfing in the snow with my boots on, holding on to this guy, right? I let go. I fall down. We start chasing the car on foot because they can't go that fast with all the snow. He goes through the intersection and he hits. He, he, he broadsides another police car that has no idea what's going on. They just so happen to be passing through. Hits them, right? We're running down the street. The, door, the cops are getting out of their car. The doors open up of the stolen car, and we're shouting, the car is fucking stolen. The car is stolen. And they're like, huh? I run. When I, my partner got there first. What I didn't see was on the passenger side, the guy had a 357 Magnum, big gun. The guy, when he got out of the car, he turned to shoot my partner, and my partner just cracked him in the head with his gun and knocked him back into the, into the car window and broke it. And when he hit him with his gun, the bad guy dropped his gun on the ground and fell on it like a fumble, right? So I'm on the passenger side pulling the passenger out, getting him handcuffed, and I see this fucking fight going on on the other side of the car. Finally, they get him subdued, and the, and the cop, one of the other cops picks up this big 357 Magnum and says, your partner dropped his gun. I go, that's not his gun. And he looked at it and goes, oh, shit. And then everything made sense. And those guys, the funny thing is, those guys had carjacked the car the night before. So a night or two before, you had this Jamaican guy that owned a body shop, and it was a customer's car, and the guy was going to take the car home. So he's closing up his body shop, and these two guys with hooded – um I, I forget if they had – oh, they had ski masks. They point the gun at the, at the Jamaican guy, and they go, give me the keys to the car. So the Jamaican guy goes, here. And it was a two-door car, and they, they told him, get in the back seat. And he knew they were going to kill him because he gave him the car. He gave him the money. Why do they want to take him? He goes, no, I'm not going. So they started shooting at him. So the Jamaican guy took off and they took his car, right? So that night I called up, one of us called up the victim and we said, can you identify him? He goes, he says, he goes, I'll never forget his eyes. He goes, and I remember their voice. So what we did was we did a voice lineup. So what we did was we put them in two separate lineups with people that are about their height and weight. And we had each one step up and say what they said the night before, like, yo, yo, give me the keys or I'm going to shoot you, whatever they said. And the Jamaican guy, he's listening. And when it was their turn, he goes, him. And he pointed them both out. So we went to trial on one. One guy got 10 years. The guy with the gun got 10 years. And the passenger that fucking took me for a ride down the block, I think he got like three or four years. Huh. Just another Tuesday when you're a cop. And then you come home and your wife asks you, hey, honey, how was work? Do you even bother explaining? Do you just say, hey, it was, it was all right. I'm not married, but my parents would ask a lot. My dad was fascinated with it. Like my dad was like a kid. So what happened? Anything but, happened? And like, I'm like, dad, sometimes, sometimes shit doesn't happen. But do you ever get criminals who are so super smart and creative that you just have yes. to give them respect that you say, you know what? No, yeah. You're a savage. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, nobody I'd, I'd hang out with. But I was fascinated with some of these guys, like the guy I was telling you about that was involved in all these homicides. He never pulled the trigger, but he was like Forrest Gump, like he was fucking involved in everything. And I just would listen like, I mean, this guy, I says, how many cars? I go, let me ask you, because he was always stealing, like just by listening to him on the phone, he was out stealing seven days a week. And I would go, how often are you confronted by the owner of a car or someone goes, hey, what the fuck are you doing? Right. He goes, probably about. 60, 70, every 60 or 70 times I steal a car, like somebody comes out, I go, what do you say? And he had a funny one line. He goes, when the person comes running over, especially if it's a newer car, I go, whoa, 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 don't get mad at me. Get mad at your bank. I'm just the repo guy. You know, a lot of these people, if they just put these skills and these like these creative skills and all the creativity into some business, they would be successful businessmen. Literally. Oh, absolutely. Oh, Literally. Him? I don't know what he's doing now. I've looked him up a couple of times because he's got a very common name. Haven't been able to figure out where he is or what he's doing. If he went straight, he's probably very successful. If he got Fuck bored, yeah. 
if he got bored, he's doing the same thing all over again. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's either one or the other. Yeah. They're right. Yeah. He did yeah, 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Like he wound up doing 10 years, even with his cooperation. So, I mean, nobody wants to lose 10 years of their life. And he had been in jail even before doing that 10. So I'm kind of hoping he turned his life around. Like, listen, I didn't like him. I definitely respected him. I mean, he made my life interesting. I mean, just some of the shit he was involved in. I mean, these people are savages. I do give them respect. For a while, my neighbor, <laughs> she's going to beat the shit out of me if she sees that. <laughs> but I'm not saying her name. So You're it's not giving your addre her address or... No, no, no. Like, people don't know who I am. We, I have 100 neighbors here. Anyway, for a while, she was she got so creative. Her and this other person, they had a tactic when they went shoplifting. So what they would do is they would have two big bags, okay? The bags were the same. There were two big blue bags. So what, they, I mean, both of them were empty. So what they would do is the first one would get in the shop. So she would open up the bag and she would fill it with merchandise that was pretty light. And then she would leave it there and leave the shop with no merchandise and no bag. That's not illegal. But then my neighbor would get in, okay? So she would be wearing that same, like the second bag that was empty, right. okay? So she would be literally shopping, but not putting it in her bag, putting it in her, uh, I don't know, or just watching or whatever. And then she would stand where that first bag is and put her bag down where that bag is. And then she would reach out from another shelf for an item for a merchandise and then she wouldn't look at a bag. She would pick up the bag, but it would be the other bag. Okay. Right. So she would leave the empty one there and pull up the, the one that's filled with merchandise that is light enough. And then she would exit the store with that bag full of merchandise. She did not do anything illegal because she didn't know hypothetically that she was taking another bag because the bag was the same and there was no difference in, um, in weight. She got away with it. I'll tell you a wild story with shopping bags. So vice cops, you know what vice is, right? No. Prostitution, gambling. Oh, okay, okay. So see, there's I a see. unit in the NYPD that deals with prostitution, gambling, and shit like that, right? So our office was right next to vice. And those guys had the best stories, right? So one of them told me a story I liked. I couldn't believe it. So in New York, you have what's called the Port Authority building in lower Manhattan. It's where all the buses come in, the Greyhound buses from across the country. And then you have a large prostitution problem in that building, specifically the men's rooms, right? So you have a lot of male prostitutes there. So my friend was telling me a story where the male prostitutes would carry two empty shopping bags and they would go with the John into a toilet stall and shut the door the prostitute would sit on the toilet and then the john would put one leg in each shopping bag so if you walk by the stall it only looked like there was one person sitting on the toilet oh. because the two legs were in a shopping bag then the guy would drop his pants and the guy sitting on the bowl would take care of him right so they said, you know, when we would hear moaning coming from a stall and two shopping bags, we would open the door and we would lock them up. I go, did you ever kick in a door and it was a guy taking a dump and he yeah. just happened to bring in two shopping bags? He goes, it's happened. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck, yo, people are smart, though. What's the oh. dumbest criminal you remember? I'll tell you, I don't know dumb, but it's funny. Watching this guy one time walking around looking in cars it's only a matter of time before this fucking guy breaks into a car he's looking in he's trying door handles right he's like he's getting closer and closer he ducks into a pizza parlor for about five minutes he comes out goes around the block breaks so it breaks into a car right we come fucking running up the block pull the guy out of the car he's covered in glass i handcuff him i stick my hand into his pocket to search him and i burn my hand I go, what the fuck he put a hot slice of pizza in his pocket. I says, wouldn't you eat the pizza? He goes, nah, he goes, I wanted a radio. But I burned my hand on, on like a hot slice of fucking Sicilian in his pocket. I had like melted cheese. What the fuck? <laughs> I'd love to be a cop for a day. I think you could do it. Oh, I definitely could. I could. I could. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm not going to keep wanna you hear, from you much. Hear all, you want to hear one more story? Yes. 
I'll tell, you, I'll tell you stories all day long. So there was a spot in the Bronx where people used to break into cars all the time. So on one side of the road, you have a cemetery. The other side of the road, you have this long wooded area. People would park their car and walk to the train. So no one, there's no one around. And this is before cell phones. You could break into a car. Who's going to call the cops, right? We watch this junkie. He's walking down the street. People have a walk. If someone's going someplace, they got their head down, they're looking straight ahead, they're going. Someone that's going to do something, they're always dusting themselves off. They, they'll tie their shoe. They're looking around. So we, we were on him. We're watching him with binoculars. He sits on a bench, and I'm watching him do this. Just watching him for binoculars going. Gets up, and the next thing I know, he's in this car. It's like, what the fuck? We pull up. Window's broken. He's inside the car. We drag him out. We lock him up. Broke the window. He's taking shit out of the car, right? Can't figure out. We didn't hear the window break. We didn't see him throw a brick through the window. How the fuck did he break that window? Like how? He didn't have a tool, right? And I searched him. He had these little, like a broken piece of a spark plug in his pocket, like the ceramic, you know, mm -hmm. the white part mm -hmm. of the spark plug. Mm -hmm. So he was a heroin addict and he was, got, he was going into withdrawal. And I says, come on, man. Tell me how you got into that fucking car. I saw you. He goes, buy me a soda. So I'll buy you soda. So, but oh, you got a fucking bar. It's like kids. You got a bargain with dice. I'll get you soda. I said, it's not going to make your case one way or the other. I watched you do it. He goes, get me a soda. I said, I'll get you soda. I got him a Coke, right? He goes, he picks up one of the broken pieces of spark plug. He goes, Ninja Rock. Goes, what the fuck is a Ninja Rock? He goes, you take a spark plug and you break it up with a hammer. Those little pieces, if you flick, not hard, if you just flick that at tempered glass, it will break the glass and barely make a sound. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Neither oh. did I. Wow. Well, you learn something new every day. Yeah. <laughs> See, and with the, all the technology, it makes it hard for criminals. If people had cell phones, I mean, now they have cameras everywhere. So right, your right. stories from back in the days are probably way better than the cops have them, you know, yeah. today. Because you are limited as a criminal today. Oh, you know? the car chases. And back in the days, also, things used to be so cheap. But now they have cameras everywhere. Oh, yeah. And I probably, I mean, we were never allowed to get into car chases, but we did it anyway. Probably nowadays they'd be looking to take your head off for getting into a car chase, but that's right. They were, yeah, oh, they were yeah. fun. I don't know. World is becoming boring. So anyway, <laughs> tell me <laughs> where can people find you? So sure, if you go to the Amazon book section, just type in my name, Vic V I C Ferrari, like the car. My book library will come up. All my books are ten dollar paperback. Two ninety nine ebook download. If you like stolen car stories, check out my book Grand Theft Auto: The NYPD's Auto Crime Division. It's everything you wanted to know about the stolen car industry. Fuck if you yeah. want to get a hold of me on Instagram or Twitter, um, at Vic Ferrari five zero. All righty then. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Rhapsody.